I've started yeah. switching it up and and beginning with like a punchy little question. So me. I listened to an interview you did on mm. on like a beauty podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so Oh no, I listened to that and then of course the intro to your podcast. Yes, my intro one, Chaos, but we got it all out there. It was amazing. <laughs> and oh, you liked it, that's good. Yes. And that's what I wanted to ask you is how did you learn how to accept yourself? Mm. Okay, so I actually think a key thing. So my therapist Vanessa, who I send everyone to, like so many people in my life go to Vanessa is I remember I was sitting there with her. We're talking about things I wanted to work on. This is like when I first went to therapy and I, I'm quite hard on myself um, instinctively. Like I'm better now at being, having way more self-compassion, but like the default is I'm quite hard on myself. And she was like, Georgie, you can't hate yourself into a version of yourself that you love. And that sounds kind of woo-woo, but it is so true. Like I always thought, that if I was like stayed hard on myself and like tried to fit into whatever bloody lane I was trying to fit myself into, then I would like myself. But then that's that, what's that thing called? The arrival fallacy that you're like, I'll be happy when, is that that thing? So then I'm like, um, okay, I just got some balloons on my camera. I think, I think whenever I do, whenever I do inverted commas, which sometimes I do on like work calls, it does balloons. Anyway, the arrival fallacy. So I think I thought, okay, if I change all these things about myself, then I'll accept myself or then I'll be happy with myself. And so I think, yeah, partly it was just rewiring that understanding. But then in terms of how I learned to accept myself, like I actually think part of it was maturity. It was a lot of therapy. It was a lot of coaching. Like I'm talking in lock, and this is all coming from a big position of privilege, right? To be able to have, I was kind of living at home. It was locked down. I wasn't spending money. I was earning money. I kept my job. So I was like throwing cash at self work and books and stuff. Um, and and I think time. time, totally. And I also was doing it in this weird, like it was, it was we were very inward. Like I wasn't then going out and comparing myself to other people. I was like in my cocoon of self-work. Um, and yeah, so I think I was like critically examining all these different parts of myself and digging, 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 like really niche things. Like if you imagine like a brainstorm, a tree with roots, it's like any narrative I kind of had about myself that was getting in the way of me accepting myself, I went deep on and like got challenged on it. You know, like this big thing about my relationship with attention. I love being the center of attention, like not in a, like even saying that you sound like a wanker, but I just, I'm happy when the attention's on me, but I'm also happy when the attention's on other people. Like I'm not, I don't, I'm not gagging for it. I just, I don't mind being, yeah, having the attention on me. And one of my coaches who I worked with, that was actually in a work context, but she was like, I was like, am I an attention seeker? Like, am I trying to get validation? And we did like a 45 minute like Q and A where she was just asking me questions, like firing questions. So I didn't even have time to think it was like so instinctive. And at the end of it, she was like, no, you just like attention. But she's like, you can, you can push and pull with it. You can change gears with it. Whereas when I was younger, I think I definitely needed the attention, craved the attention overcompensated. Anyway, so that's just one example, but there were like, 10 to 20 things like that where I just went so deep on them. And then I think honestly as well, I had a really beautiful relationship in lockdown and I know that you should not rely on other people to like make you love you, but that did. Like that just taught me so much compassion, so much self-love. Um, so I kind of reject the thing that's like, eh, you have to love yourself before someone else can love you. I'm like, no. You can go into a relationship and meet each other where you both are and hopefully grow and learn. So that was honestly a big part of it. Amazing. That's so beautiful. Yeah, no, that I've spoke actually on this podcast as well. The the guy who's like the expert, the Oxford psychiatrist in suicide prevention, he, I couldn't believe that was one of his 
responses was like people can often get better like through new relationships because yeah it's not like a save all for sure totally um but yeah multiple kind of psychologists it's like yeah it's like have been set yeah yeah it's like you learn it very healing grow and yeah yeah it was like a right person yes but it was also abusive or something no totally totally and I think as well it's like it's not just because you have someone who's loving you so then you see how much you can love yourself it's like multifaceted right it's like it's a mirror so when you're in a relationship you know the shit that you're judging or whatever is just your stuff you're often projecting so then that helps you go deeper on your own stuff. And I also think, you know, it doesn't have to be like a romantic partner, even though I do think there's nothing quite like being loved and being in love. Like I'm a romantic in that way. But you can get that with different like girlfriends, like friends, with family. Like it's I think also because I'm very extroverted and I kind of had never been in love before. I think that whole thing, that whole process for me was just like first proper love and relationship was really healing plus lockdown plus the self-work plus maturity I definitely like walked in and out of lockdown a very different person amazing yeah 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 and it's like we're social beings and also doing all that inner work it's so happy it can go like because I think I had a period of that but it was not healthy because it was so internal and then it's like you're yes stuck and then like you actually need other people you know the point of being yes human is we're social animals we need to be connecting and but that's so nice that totally. you're with your family so I'm assuming you were feeling like quite supportive yeah 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 very supported um yeah, in relationship with around my family, lucky to have a lot of friends like living close to me would go for like I, I would sometimes in lockdown go for like three walks a day with different friends. That is like three hours of like one-on-one beautiful connecting, talking. Um, so even though obviously lockdown was horrendous for so many people for so many reasons and I didn't love it at the time, but in hindsight I'm like, fuck, I was lucky that I got to do that. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I was just laughing when you said being the center of attention because it's so good for this podcast because often people come on who are really quite shy. They do not like, (laughs) they're so hesitant to come on here. And then afterwards they're so self-conscious about it. And I'm like, no, you need to send this to everyone. And they're like, oh my God. Anyway, so like, this is the energy we need for the podcast. So it's amazing. Okay. So... Wait, before we go into how you grew up, but maybe it will like, you can wind it in. You mentioned Mm. like on accepting yourself, there were things you wanted to change or things that you felt like you had to be in a certain way. So what are those things? Yes, this is so good. And I have the best way of explaining it. So all my life growing up, I was always like told I was too much and I was thought I was too much which I am not too much like I'm a lot though but the, I'm fine with that now but like for so many years it was like I just did not have a handle on it like I couldn't like now my bigness and my energy and my allotness I know what to do with it I know that I need to be running and intellectually stimulated and I have amount of catch-ups in a week that would like make other people exhausted but that's just how I need to operate right Like, that's how I feel in flow. I feel good that way. So I had this weird thing, again, back to Vanessa, the therapist, when I was, like, explaining it to her when I first met her. She was like, why are you here? I was actually there because I would get too drunk and I wouldn't know why because I was like, I don't don't think I'm unhappy. Like, I don't know what's going on. I would just get too pissed to the point where it's like, okay, have a chat about that. Um, And it was just, like, becoming impactful, like, on the people around me. Um, But... Yeah, so I went, I was like, I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but, like, why am I drinking too much? And then secondly, she was like, okay, but what do you want? I was like, I, everyone else thinks I'm up here too much and I'm, like, down here. You can't even see. I'm, like, down here. I think I'm not enough. I was like, all I want is to be here. Like, and when I was saying to be here, I meant, like, in the middle. I wasn't, like, cognizant that I was putting my hands on my heart. But it was actually so fucking true because – 
I wasn't really in my heart space. I was like so in my head, so conscious of how I was perceived and what other people thought. But then at the same time, there was this, I guess, like sadness or this sense of like lacking that this not enoughness thing, this kind of un- that I, narrative that I was unlovable. And so, yeah, in terms of like what I wanted to change, I think the key thing was like, why can't I just be normal? even though like what even is that? Or I would have these images of people in my head who I'd be like, well, I want to be like that person. If I'm like that, then I'll accept myself, then I'll be enough. It's like you are nothing like that person. Your superpower is that you are not that person. Um, and what type of people were they? Like it was like poised women. It was like people who were more poised than me. They were like powerful, amazing women. But they're just like bosses or people I knew who I'm like, they're just different to me. Like I am not like them. I am big and like kind of chaotic to other people, but I'm not chaotic in my own head. So like my family call me a tornado and it's, it's really accurate because I am a bit of a tornado. Like I, you know, even when I walk into a house, I walked in, I've been at a wedding this weekend. I walked in, I literally like put one bag at the door. No one's at home at the moment. Thank God. I'm, I'm currently staying at my parents. So I have to be more respectful in their space. But, like, I'll literally dump shit at the door, dump some shit on the table, took my bra off because I was getting changed, like, sunglasses. Like, it, it was literally like a trail of destruction, right? I can, like, physically be a tornado, but I'm really calm in the eye of the storm. Like, I'm to, – everything to me, I'm like, yep, yeah, fine. And one of my best friends, Lil, she finds it so funny Cause like I have a perfectly color coordinated diary. Like I know exactly what's going on and I have this level of kind of structure and self-management, which allows me to maintain that kind of like tornado chaotic frivolousness. Cause I like just doing things that I want to do, but to do that and to, 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 to like have that approach, but still kind of work how I want to work, run how I want to run, catch up with who I want to catch up with. There's actually a level of discipline that's required to maintain that. Because there was a time in my life where it was just all fucking chaos. And that was kind of the early 20s thing leading up to when I'm like, oh, I'm too much. Everyone else thinks I'm too much. I think I'm not enough. So, yeah, it was definitely about, it was that kind of, I didn't, I didn't want to be like that. And I wanted, you know, I didn't think I was attractive enough. I thought I would be too fucking big for guys to like me. Like, yeah, I am too big for some guys to like me whatever they're not my guy then you know um so it was mainly the it was like that thing the bigness and who was telling you or was it all like everyone like Like everyone it's it's literally for as long as I can remember like my family do it in a way that I appreciate like we like piss take they're like oh fuck she's here the tornado like but they do it in a way that I kind of like, okay, yeah, probably it's unhealthy. Any narratives that you just kind of say about your siblings or whatever, yes, you could examine them. Some of them are probably unhelpful. But I have honestly heard this for as long as I can remember because I am loud. Like teachers would say this to me, you know, family, friends. Like I also, because I am centre of attention, because I am an open book, I invite so much feedback. Sometimes it's unsolicited. But you, the more actual feedback you ask for that is solicited, the more unsolicited you inherently just like get, I think, because I'm so open. I just, people just like, I just know what people think. I'm perceptive, but they also tell me, you know, like I had this one, um, like I went, I did this interview with this chick who worked in a law firm. That was the other fucking thing is like, I couldn't really see lawyers who looked like me when I was trying to be a lawyer at this time. And then I was also kind of trying to be a journalist and they were also way like more straighty 180 than me. I was like, oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, I had this chat with this lawyer and a family friend connected me. And I remember this was at my brother's 21st. The family friend was kind of like, you know, like she did say he didn't mean like too big for your boots, but he was like, you know, pipe down a bit kind of thing, which partly is actually good advice. Like, don't act like you know everything. Listen more. Like, when you are going for those kind of, like, mentor chats, like, but I just, I always took it, I took it so personally because I think I was so self-conscious of, like, 
I think I felt misunderstood because even when I was younger and people would be like, you know, George, like, you know, you get in trouble for like saying shit to people. Like teachers would say, well, how would you feel if someone said that to you? I'm like, well, I would feel fine because I actually would often feel fine. What kind so, of stuff? Oh, like, you know, when you're like in primary school, like, let's say I would just say like, I can't even think of it. Like, I genuinely can't think of an example, but I would run my mouth. Like I'd fucking run my mouth. I'd say stuff. Um, and, and then, yeah, the teacher, if the teacher would say, well, how would you feel? I'm like, well, I wouldn't care if someone said that to me, which for a lot of stuff, I wouldn't, that's the thing, but that doesn't matter because my threshold is different. So yes, I think I've just always been told that boys as well. Like even my, like my girlfriends, like will say it with more love and warmth, but like my guy friends, we have a very like banterful, like somewhat like brutal banterful relationship. And they'll be like, Oh, fucking G like she's heaps. It, it was sort of like that narrative, which now when someone says it, it, it doesn't worry me. Cause I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm heaps. I'm like, and what? <laughs> you know um and like even I love there's this really cute quote that's like oh if someone's saying like you're too much it's like okay so you want me to be less you literally just want me to be less um but yeah now I think it's funny because I like myself now and I and I also my this is another kind of theme that fits in with this it's like power like I think I now think that I'm quite powerful like in how I speak, my presence, like I'm very direct. Um, like I know I'm intelligent. I'm like objectively attractive, right? It's like those things are like come across as that's like power. And I did not think I was powerful. Like I just did not understand that. And I think that was part of the problem is that I thought I was just like this chaotic tornado. I was like, what's the point of this? Whereas now I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of understand how to harness this, number one. And number two, yeah, I think because I can feel that I'm powerful. I don't know. It's like I can understand it more now, whereas I couldn't understand it. I thought I was like this weakling, unlovable thing who just happened to be like loud and annoying. And then that, so even though I'm still big, yeah, it's just like it's been, it's matured as well. And I think, you know, even when I was young, like mum used to always have to say to me, like, think it, don't say it. Cause I would just like open my mouth. And that to me, there were times when I'm like, Oh, did I get a bit like not suppressed, but was it like, Oh, they were trying to put me in a box. I'm like, no, that was just good parenting. Cause I would have fucking got myself in trouble so many times if they didn't try and teach me to rein it in. Amazing. Okay. Oh, no, you're frozen. No, no, no. I've got you. I've got you. I'm listening. Okay. Fuck the video. Um, okay, so how – I have so much to say, but let's, go. we need to go back to how you grew up. Okay. Oh, so that's like the question. Yes, that's the question. Okay, great. How did I grow up? I honestly haven't done much um, – like I should have thought about this because that's a big question. How did I grow up? Is that question like what my upbringing was like or like how I grew up, how I matured? I, I think it's the former, not the latter. However you want to answer it. Okay. But I guess it would be good for us to get a sense of like yes. who you are in the world. I want to like put it, I want to like preface this by saying that there is a lot of privilege in how I grew up. So I'm just saying that because in terms of like family dynamic, lack of trauma, like love, resources, etc. This sounds idyllic because it largely is. Um, and that's not to say that there's there's not struggles and like it's not all, you know, sunshine and roses, but it's just like like the evidence, the just the base facts. Like, yeah, there's a lot of privilege. So I'm one of four. I'm number two in the family. So I'm twenty-eight. So I was born in 95, grew up in like the suburbs, like, you know, very green, like kind of like daggy, but inner city still, not like inner, inner city. You would know North Portland, but it's like, I don't know how to describe that to people who would have no context of that. But yeah, it's basically like cute little villagey vibes. Anyway, um, I kind of like 
kinder and primary school and stuff. I don't, I didn't love primary school. Um, I preferred the later half of secondary school. I feel like I came more into my own then. Um, so in that house, mum and dad, um, mum is like very dynamic, fiery, busy, huge capacity of what she can get done in a day, very high energy levels. Um, dad is more sort of like calm, plods away. They have a really good balance. Then my older brother, Matt, he's like typical eldest child, I reckon. Um, like just more sensible, straight, studious vibes. Then there's me. Then there's my younger brother, Jack. Um, Jack was kind of like quieter, I guess, when he was younger, but then maybe like a little bit naughtier later. And then Pooks, my younger sister, she was like mummy's girl, youngest child. Um, so growing up, what was the vibe? We were always busy. We were doing stuff big. My mum is huge on having like people in the house. Like we were always at friends' houses or people were always at our house. Lots of sport, lots of activities. Food is just a huge part of my life and our lives. Like always has been. Like even when, you know, mum and dad were working hard to make ends meet, like the food was always still top notch. Be mum like, you know, I'd wake up to the smell of mum like making dinner for that night like she'd be making it in the morning she would get up before us all lunches and everything will always be beautiful um and then you know one thing I hated about my childhood was like the rush to get in the car every morning because it was like dad was often gone mum's wrangling like four kids under the age of six and then progressively up and I remember that always being like stressful um but then I think of myself now and I'm like I run around like that and fit too much in the day as well um yeah, we, yeah, there was lots of, yeah, there was just lots of activities and yeah, I did like basketball, I did drama, I did public speaking, I ran a lot, we were always at the park. I did not like, I never have liked cartoons, fantasy, make-believe, anything. I used to watch The Sound of Music most days and um, I would have my lunch during the intermission, like this is when I was really little. Um, yeah, I remember being outdoors a lot. I always would go to people's houses for sleepovers. I've always loved going to other places and I still do love this. Like I was happy to have people over, but like, you know, one of my best friends that like we lived over the back fence, our mums did catering together. They would, we, we would like call each other and be like, who's having the better dinner? And then we would like go to that one's house. Um, I think cause I'm also a lot, like I'm just constant, you know, it was easy to remove me from the equation cause I was happy to be removed. So I would go to like, one of mum's friends' houses or like my auntie, like my godmother's house or my grandparents' house. So, yeah, there was definitely a lot of time with adults. I loved adult conversation. Like I would, they used to call me flaps, like flappy ears. Like I would want, I would like sit on the bottom of the stairs when I was supposed to be in bed and like listen. And then obviously mum would just be like, come and listen. Um, like I loved our babysitters. I loved talking to, I've, I always just loved humans and like older people. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of celebrations, a lot of busyness, you know, secondary school. So that was kind of like primary school vibes. Um, and I, why I had you like school. I just think it's like the misunderstood thing. I think I probably, I actually don't think I was a super happy little person. I think I was. I think I've always been more heady and perceptive than my, than my like probably maturity would have like allowed for. Um, like I had a really strong sense of justice, for example, didn't know how to use it. Like once someone said something racist, so like I threw a fucking apple at their head or like, you know, like, or something else happened. This guy was being an absolute prick. So I like put a little bit of dirt in like all of their drinks and then I got a detention and then like wrote a thing in detention being like, I wouldn't have done that if they hadn't have done this. Like, so, and then I also, you know, I like, this is, it's so, I don't, I can't think of exact examples, but I know that I would have been a bully. Like there were times when I would have been a bully and I'm like, okay, well hurt people, hurt people. I'm like, if you're not a hurt person, you know what I mean? And I'm like, for me, I don't know. It's, it's like, 
if I felt kind of misunderstood generally, was I projecting? Like, I don't really know. Um, but I know there would have been times when I just like, it was like the running my mouth thing, but not in a way that was like, sometimes I got in trouble for stuff that I'm like, I don't need to get in trouble for this. Other times it was like, well, I was just being a little bit of a bitch in the schoolyard. Um, in primary school. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and that's even been like, I've discussed this with a therapist since then, because sometimes I can be, I'm like, not too nice now. Like I just love people and I just have a lot of love and warmth to give, but like one of my psychs who I saw, my ADHD psych, he's like my most recent one who I just saw for like when I got diagnosed, you know. And he's like, I think you overcompensate. He's like, I think you're like so lovely and like nice that you're sometimes overcompensating for this like guilt you have for whenever you were just being like a little brat when you were younger. Um, huh. which, yeah. Were so, you, yeah, go. Were you like, was it like targeting people, bullying or more just like, I don't even remember it being like, this is why I felt misunderstood because I don't ever remember thinking I want to make that person feel like shit. Like, I do not remember feeling that. Um, I feel like I just would have been impulsive. If someone's like annoying me instead of being like, don't be mean to them. I'll probably just like pick the battle. I'd be like, I'd like have the fight. And I think there definitely wouldn't have been an, would have been an element element of um, just like general schoolyard bullshit of like when you you be a bitch or you do something like funny that's actually mean to keep everyone else on site like I always say to one of my babysitting girls I'm like who's like 16 I'm like and she tells me what people do you know bitchy shit exclusive stuff I'm like people only do that because they're so fucking worried about their own spot in the tribe it's like this real primal belonging thing so my sorry I'm holding this hair clip just because I like to fiddle um, belonging is one of my number one values, love and belonging. And so I think there would have been something in that pack mentality thing that I was just acting out against in terms of if I was being bitchy, but I can't think of examples, but I know that I was because it's got like gotten back to me that I was, and I regularly get feedback even now when people meet me properly. And this happened in secondary school as well, where people, if they didn't know me because of the allotness because of how I come across and we're like, Oh, it's fucking Georgie Owen thinks her shit doesn't stink. But then as when they'll get to know me, they'll be like, Oh no, like you actually are a nice person. I'm like, yes, I am. And like even a PA at work, I kind of started maybe like a year later, I was like sitting on her desk or chatting. She's like, you know, Georgie, I just thought you were one of those like bitchy, like obnoxious, like popular girls, but you're actually not like that when you get to know you. I'm like, Oh good. That's good. But like, I think that's, yeah, I think I, I think I felt misunderstood. Um, I think I probably also was understimulated. Like I look at myself at the moment and I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I'm living between two States. The job I'm doing is so fucking hard for me. It's like, there should have been someone more senior in it, but I'm like stepping up, you know, I've got a wedding on every weekend. It's like my life at the moment is so stimulated, stimulating, stimulated. And my mental health feels the best ever. And I think that I was, yeah, primary school, I was just like not, I don't know, I always got in trouble. Like, oh, Georgie, you're talking. I'm like, well, I'm finished. Give me something else to do. Um, So I think I'm probably just someone who needs to be busy. Like I don't mean to hide, you know. Sometimes when people say that to me, I'm like, what are you fucking running from? It's like I think I've got a good handle of what the demons can be that are in my head. But I just like being busy and stimulated and I think I could probably be slightly destructive when I'm not. Um, but yeah, so and even like friend stuff, like I kind of, I always had like fairly solid friends. I had all the normal friendship shit, you know, like in year eight, that was an awful year. Um, like it was just teenage girls being teenage girls. Like I was being iced out probably because people decided, oh, we don't like her or how she operates or she's not cool enough. I was very opinionated on, like, why are you drinking? Your brain's not developed. Like, I drank underage, but in year eight I was like, nah. Or, like, smoking's fucking dumb. Why would you smoke? Um, I was also very, like, you know, suppressed in a way with, like, boys. And I feel like then everyone was, like, flirting with boys. And so then I would be, like, judgmental of that, which is probably more of a projection for me. But there was just, like, 
that's why I think the year eight vibe was hard. But that was like painful. Like I remember at the time being like, this is awful. Um, and what happened? It's like it's it's so intangible, isn't it, though? Like teenage girls bullying. It was just like a general vibe that you are not wanted, not invited, you, excluded. Did you end up friends with them again or you found new friends? No, I stuck with it. I remember mum being like, I didn't raise you. I didn't raise you like this. And some of them, like some of those girls who were in that group who weren't like none of the actual like direct perpetrators of the vibe are like my best friends now. But the girls who were in that group, they're my best friends now. Like I love them. But but they were also in year eight and were also, you know, just doing whatever they were doing. That it's like, why are they going to go out and threaten their belonging in the tribe, in the pack, and stand up for the one who's trying to get out, like for the one who's being ousted, you know? Um, So, I mean, in my head it went on for a long time, but then everything's like, you know, Silver, I think that shit's formative. And like then I made way closer friends with like girls from my class who are now like my best friends as well. Like I kind of opened that up as well. I mean, it kind of made me close with mum. Like mum and I have only really gotten close, close the last few years. Um, but there are just little things along the way that I look at and think, oh, that brought us closer. And I think that was one thing. Because my mum can be like, she can like crack it about a messy room but she's like amazing in crisis or for big things. Like I always say, yeah, like small things she can be like a nutter about, but big things she's like amazing with. Um, so, yeah, what else can I say about growing up? Do you have questions? <laughs> so what? Yeah, questions. So family, yeah. what, were the, what did your parents want for you? For, I guess the four of you and what were the values they tried to instill in you yeah so I think um they I think what they wanted for us I would just say to like live out your potential like be happy have fun live out your potential they're big on like fun as well as hard work so this is interesting we all went really well in school right like I my brother got I don't know both the boys got in the like nineties, my sister high eighties, whatever. Everyone got what they needed to do. To, everyone like got the mark that they needed to do what they needed to do. I don't think ATARs are important. I think they're, they show grit more than anything. And I don't think they're important for like uni. You can always find a way in. I got 99.5. That was like surprising and unsurprising to me and everyone around me. Um, my parents never once looked at, knew about or checked homework. They just like did not know about it. Maybe for my younger sister, but not for me. All they wanted, all they wanted was for us to read. They're like, as long as you're reading, we don't care. And I was like a voracious reader. Um, but they never, you know, hard work was just implied. Like, because, you know, mum was like a PA, would also do catering. Like she'd be breastfeeding a kid in a car. Like the dad would take to a catering job. Like mum just worked fucking hard. And dad has always worked really hard as well. Like just, you know, long hours, corporate jobs. Like, you know, I look, he's, yeah, he's just like, they're both very kind of acts of service people in terms of love languages. And so I think what they, yeah, how they lived was kind of like they were the values. We didn't have like tangible discussions like that. Like we're not, I wouldn't say we're a huge like D&M type family but yes hard work so that you can have fun and live out your potential I would say that's what they wanted um wait there was another part of that question it was what it was what did they want for you and what were the values yeah Yeah. community huge like mum and I are always like it's a red flag if someone doesn't have like friends from along the way mum's so big on like you pick your friends up along your life in all your different areas um so, you know, just so many, like, big celebrations. Like, it's just normal for mum to have, like, a Christmas drinks or whatever, like, for us to host something that has, like, 30 people at it. Like, I can cook dinner for, like, 25 people and I'm like, easy because that's what I've grown up around. Um, you know, and I think going back to that kind of I'm jumping around but going back to that hard work thing, like, yeah, they'd never checked my homework or whatever, but I know that sometimes I'd be like, oh, I got this mark at school. Like let's say I got like a good mark in an English essay or something. 
And mum wouldn't be like, well done, darling. She'd be like, so you should. Like, you're a good reader and writer. You absolutely should get that. Whereas she would take a different approach to say my brother, who wasn't as strong on that, she would, you know, alter her how she would parent in that way. Um, whereas dad is more like a gushing, like proud parent. And mum's like, oh, you know, like sometimes rolls her eyes at that. Mum's like, oh, whatever. So I think, yeah, I think that's what they wanted for us. And I think a big, you know, we we always went on like a holiday. Sorry, I just burped. Um, lots of like beach time, you know, and mum was really big on like, you don't need to be the coolest don't be in the cool group. Like you don't need to be the coolest person. Like treat everyone well. Don't get too big for your boots kind of thing. Like, you know, I didn't have, I was like, thought it was social suicide. There was a lot of social media I didn't have until a few years later. I never had MSN. I had Facebook like way later than everyone else, which in hindsight, I'm like, okay, like that's actually part of your social development. I would have liked to have had it. But I kind of like that mum's like, just stood her ground, mum and dad. I'm saying mum because mum probably was around more when we were younger. Dad was just like at the office more. Um, so, yeah, more questions, more questions because I have good answers. I just sometimes can't think off the top of my head where I want to spit at you. Oh, my God. I'm je- I thought you were going to say in hindsight I'm so glad. I'm, like, jealous. I think back of, like, how much time I spent on MSN, like, <laughs> Chatting to people, it's like such no, a waste of time. But yeah, I, think I guess it's good it for your good. social development. Mm. Um. Okay, so what did you want for yourself at school, and what like did you just know you were good at school, or was that part of like proving yourself? Or this is weird because my relationship with like hard work and achievement, I feel like, is only now just healthy. So this is interesting. So, um, okay, in primary school, I was, like, always put in the smart group with the boys. It was just me and the boys. And I didn't – I don't remember loving that. I don't remember loving that. I would always – I think I derived more validation out of, like – no, I didn't really care about being in the smart group or not being in the smart group. I cared more about like, oh, Georgie, can you speak in an assembly? Like that would be like, yes, thank you, I can. Like I liked that stuff. Um, so I didn't really think about it consciously because school was just always easy. Like I literally could do so little and I would just go well. And then I look at high school and it's like I didn't always go well. Like in maths and science when I started not um, liking it, I just stopped doing well in it. Because this is ADHD undiagnosed as well, Right. The ADHD, you know, dopamine deficient brain is driven by urgency and interest. Therefore, if something wasn't urgent or interesting, couldn't give a shit. So high school comes along, quit maths and science in year 10. So I was like, I don't like them. I'm not doing them. Everyone's like, well, you need them. I'm like, what for? I don't need them. Um, So I wasn't, I didn't like Excel. I, I mean, I was good. I was good. I was in like probably the advanced like English class, whatever, but I'm trying to think, I don't know what I wanted for myself because I've only honestly just started to think about that. I was so, I'm so caught up in like, am I having fun? Am I doing enough? Like for me, it's about what's stimulating to me. It really isn't much ego stuff. It's like, is this stimulating? Am I engaged? Um, so year 11 and 12, I like lifted my game, but I've always been very pragmatic. Like I would go to a teacher and be like, can you please mark me as present? I need to go and write an essay. She'd be like, pardon. Like you need to be in this class. I'm like, no, I'm like, I don't need to do this class. We haven't got a sack. I'm going to do what I need to do. Like I was, which would have been obnoxious and hard because if ever, you know, and then they would say to me, Georgie, but what if everyone did that? I'm like, well, everyone doesn't do that because not everyone has my approach. So off I go. Um, so I started trying really hard in year 12 and so funny actually like wrote at the start of the year what I thought I could get in all my subjects if I like did really well and I just put it on the back of like mum and dad um write a lot of cards you have to write Christmas cards start of the year good luck have a beautiful year card and on the back of that card I wrote um like 99 whatever it was and even though I didn't actually think I would get that I wasn't surprised when I got it even though I was surprised when I got it because this is another thing I've worked on with a coach I have this thing this is another like hang up that I had that I've now finally gotten rid of. 
I have this thing that I just like bludge and don't live to my full potential and don't work hard and therefore I'm just like wasting my life even though I've like kind of achieved some stuff it's all like a facade and I should have achieved more and whereas my coach helped me to see like no Georgie you might do nothing for three days because you're procrastinating and then you do like six hours of like hyper focus like turbo exertion that like you collapse after the thing like after it I'm like I can't think I can't use my brain for like a day but she's like that's just someone else's version of like they might need to do that in a longer amount of time you know I read the book Grit by Angela Duckworth I think it is and that was a real game changer for me because I was like bitch you got to get some grit I never had grit because I never had to mum and dad didn't like push me on the homework front the schools didn't really push me on any of that Everything was easy and then I rocked up at law school and like somehow bludged the first semester but then like kind of failed and passed my way through the rest of it. Um, So when I think about what I want for myself uh, or what I wanted for myself, I wanted to like fun and belonging, like personal life for me has been and always will be like important, like the the important thing. That That doesn't mean I don't want a really stimulating career as well. Like I want both. Um. But I think in my early 20s, I finally kind of felt like part of the pack. I I don't know, it was fun. Like I loved like traveling, drinking, going out. And so I just really let myself enjoy that. Um, Because at school I never found the, I don't know, I found socializing in school. Like I had fun, but I never found that I just like loved it. And I always felt a little bit on the outer. Whereas when I finished school, I stopped feeling like that. So I was just having a great time. I wanted to be a journalist. So all I wanted for myself was a job that I was like good at and that wasn't hard for me to be good at because of a lack of grit. And then I did journalism and I realized this is like no disrespect to journalists. I think journalism is an amazing profession, but I just felt what you do on day one as a journalist and what you do on year 33 as a broadcast journalist are like similar things. You just hone your craft. Whereas Then when I was exploring law, I was like, oh, there's so much growth. And then I realized that enter value number three for myself, self-actualization. I'm like obsessed with improving myself, learning about myself, progressing for myself. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So, so you knew at school, it sounds so similar to me. I was like on enter calculator the whole time. (laughs) Just like, it was like very strategic. So like, you yeah, it was pragmatic. Yeah, so you're like, this is the game, get the highest score possible, yeah. like do what it takes to get it. Yeah, and but I just- didn't, it's not like I actually, like, yes, I agree, but I didn't, it's not like I then went and thought I'll study every day. No. No, I it's would all like, about systems. Yes, correct. Efficiency. Yes. And I remember someone said to me, we're talking about ATARs, like as you do in year 12, again, I'm not trying to like labor the point about ATARs. I just think it's an interesting thing in terms of achievement. Everyone's trying doing it. You kind of talk about it. It's interesting in terms of ego, hard work. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a snapshot, I think, of how you approach some of those things. Anyway, we're talking about marks. And I was like, who do you reckon is going to get 99? And I'm like naming all these people. I'm like in no way actually at that point thinking I am because I'm like, well, I'm just fucking around. And this girl's like, I reckon you could. I was like, wait. I was like, what do you mean? I was like, there is an exam in like, there are exams in three weeks. I haven't read this book. I don't know the thing of this. I haven't done this. And she was like, when you put your mind to things are unstoppable. And like that perception of like, which that is like power. That's what I call power. When I was saying about being powerful before, I did not see or feel that. Another thing is um, there was this girl who I went to, like there's a girl I went to school with. And I don't know if she told me this story or if this story came back to me like through someone else. But um, because they they used to do this thing where they would go and teach, um, like talk to schools about study skills. Anyway, she told this story. The moral of the story was ask for help, like rising tide lifts all ships because this girl must have asked me for an essay one day. I must have just like given it to her. But apparently the story was that I would go into class late, which I would always be late. I probably like often, you know, wouldn't have shoes on or be like eating, sitting at the front of the class, like nonchalant blase, would get like an essay back, would look at the, would look at the mark. It would usually be like a fucking high mark. Would look at the like three comments, check, 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 put it back, keep doing whatever I was doing. And this girl was telling this story about me in terms of like, she was like, what is this girl doing? That she just like comes, waltzes in and out, gets these marks and then, you know, 
And so I think that kind of attitude of like deep pragmatism was very much me. It, it, it's like, yeah, that was, that was the approach. But then also, yeah, the moral of her story was different to the moral of the story I'm telling now. But I think, yes, it was very much, um, I don't know, like I, I would make appointments with my English teacher and be like, correct my essays, like tell me everything that's wrong with them. Or like lit, I hadn't done because I had another exam. So I like went to the teacher's house like the two days before the exam. I was like, can you please teach this to me? Like Amazing. I've just always had my own way. And that's why uni, uni's like, fuck off. Uni doesn't care about you. And that's why I struggled terribly at uni. Okay, so what did you do at uni? Oh, my God. Procrastinated, hated myself. Like, <laughs> was... Oh, like, what did I actually do? Yes. <laughs> don't you love how... Don't you love how most people, like... It's like, what did you do at uni? They'll be like, oh, like, you know, commerce engineering. And, I mean, I did arts law. I didn't do commerce engineering. But I'm like, the question, the answer I give is like, oh, what did I do? Okay, so I did arts law. The first time I cried did, was, yeah, go. Sorry, did you, so this is when you thought you wanted to be a journalist? But yes, you just, so I was majoring oh. in journalism. But then everyone's like, oh, you'd be a nutter not to do law if you get the marks because it's good for court reporting or whatever. Random. This is what happens. A lot it's of people end up doing law. Who, it's good for court like, reporting. Court reporting is like you do court like there's oh a court oh yeah yeah rotation. yeah got it yeah. got it okay but, so you were like well, just do law you weren't thinking about becoming a lawyer no I thought it was the dumbest thing ever and um I also think there's just lots of people who end up doing law because they get the marks who shouldn't do law now I love my job now it's taken me a long time to get to this so now I don't regret it but there was many years many years where I was like why did I do that like the first time I went to um and this is another thing that I think my parents are so good on. Mum was always like, just quit. Like I was not, I never had to prove anything to them in that way. As long as we're working hard, you have nothing to prove. Like there's no hangups on that front. Like I like cried when I saw the Monash Law Library. I was like, oh my God, this is horrendous. Because, you know, the, the idea of the law student and lawyer that I thought I had to be, that would be soul destroying for me. I just happened to have landed on my feet in the best buddy law firm with bosses who let me be myself. That is a, the, most other places I wouldn't have survived. This is, just happens to have been this beautiful star lining thing. But yeah, so I did arts law. Um, I just fucking hated uni. That's so, sorry, random point, but that's so funny yeah. on the law point because it's how the system is in Australia because in the US, law yeah. school happens after undergrad at another three years so yes. much money you would never just do it because you got the grade it's the same with the UK it's like a different thing but I'm just that because I had yeah it's like that oh medicine or law thing which is just like not how it works like in yes. other places in the world but anyway interesting. yes totally and I think I could have gone like we had there's one uni that does that model but I just wanted to go and get over and done with um but yeah, uni was so like tumultuous for me because uh, on one hand I was having so much fun. It was like the time of our life. I was just working, traveling, going out. But then there was all this self-loathing because I just procrastinated, 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 had to wait till the urgency was like so up to here before I would execute anything because I found it so goddamn boring. Um, and I didn't really, I, I never really liked it. Like there were maybe some subjects towards the end that I like, got a tutor, had a bit of a crack. Cause that's the thing about me. If I, if I'm not interested in something, I find it really hard to just like learn it as an abstract concept. But as soon as I have a discussion, I like, I'm a quick learner. I get it straight away. So at the end, I just had to life hack my way through it with the tutor. And then what was your thing of trying journalism? So journalism. Okay. This is, this is a good question because it opens up another like life moment so journalism was loving it I would like every year from when I was like in year 11 I would go up and do work experience at women's health magazine I was like doing community radio I was doing like everything you had to do I would again it was like not consistent it was in bursts like with me it's always bursts like sometimes I just like fuck I'm not doing enough and I'll wait up I'll stay out late one night emailing all these people being like can I do work experience with you and then I'll get all this like random work experience lined up so I was doing that, but I was just finding, I was like, is this too easy for me, for me personally? Um, it just felt like I was, I don't know. It just felt like it wasn't going to stimulate me enough in terms of like 
because I was at that point looking at doing broadcast journalism. I'm also financially motivated. And so for me, I didn't love, I think, that aspect of it. Um, and But then the main thing that caused me to open my eyes to law more was – I had to get a voice operation because I had nodules. Do you know what nodules are? Mm. So basically I got, most people get nodules from singing or like they're a sport coach or something. They're like got a job where they have to use their voice. I literally got them from talking too much and too loud, which is so hilarious. No wonder there was the not enoughness, um, the too much, nar- too much just narrative. So my voice was cooked. It would never come back after nights out. I was like, something's wrong here. Like often I'll lose my voice, but then it just wasn't coming back. And it was like, I was going for these jobs. Like I wanted to do like weekend news reporting and stuff. And I would go and do like two, you know, three, two or three like runs through a script. And they'd be like, yeah, unreal. And then on the third run, they'd be like, are you raspy? And I'd be like, uh, like no, but it was like, it was getting in the way. And, and I had to, before I had the proper nodule surgery removal, I had like two injections of cortisone, cortisone, and I couldn't talk for five days. So it was just all becoming, and then you had to be quiet, you know, more vocal rest, blah, blah, blah. That was like the funniest in hindsight, the funniest thing I could have gone through because I kind of went from being the loudest, most confident person in every room, even if the confidence was like, overcooked or slightly overdone and not self-confidence at that time but I went from being this loudest most confident person in every room to then being because then I had the voice operation you had to do like for months like reduce like vocal stuff and that was the same time when I started as a paralegal in the law firm and then I went to being like the quietest dumbest person in the room and so that was a real come to Jesus moment and it was also like I think I probably had derived or like derived stuff from my with my identity but also relied on my voice to get me places like be loud it would be it was part of the personality it was all whatever it was like I kind of hid behind the bigness of my voice and then all of a sudden I couldn't fucking use it properly and more hang-ups of like too much not enough which was very much a theme of that era so that was like maybe 22 23 I think that's kind of how old I was um I, so before I got my voice operation, everyone was like, oh, you're so loud, la, 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 fuck, we can hear you before we see you. And then after I got it, everyone's like, is Georgie depressed? What's wrong with Georgie? Like, oh, oh, you're so quiet. I'm like, I can't win. I'm like, am I too loud or am I too quiet? You guys fucking choose. Um, So that was really, like, I remember crying just being like, I just want my normal voice. I just want my voice. And I think, you know, when I was saying about like that thing, like I thought I was, everyone else thought I was too much. I thought I was not enough. I just want to be here. I feel like that's what happened with my voice. It's like my voice was too big. It was up here. I was always fucking yelling, screaming. Then I had to fully like overcorrect and like not speak as much and like really learn to be more deliberate and considered about the mechanics of my voice, which is interesting because it's kind of like a metaphor, like, I also probably in that time became more deliberate and considered about what I said too, not just how I said it. And then now I feel like my voice is my voice. I like my voice now. My voice is whatever. Like my voice is a bit raspy because I was banging a tambourine at a wedding last night, but generally my voice is good. So because I couldn't do the journalism thing, that's when I fell into law. And then I was like, okay, I may as well give Laura a crack because I have a bit of a grass is always greener issue with career and with men. Like if I'm with someone or I'm like seeing someone as an option, I'm like, but is there a better option? It's like, okay, no options. Perfect. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, and I was at the time I was trying to combine journalism and law. I wanted to do media law, but because my marks were shit and media law is really competitive. I just could not get into it. Whereas now I'm really grateful that I stayed with construction law. Because it's bigger teams, it's really practical, it's a bit more, it's not as like you have to be super reactive and in, and like married to the job, I think, in media law. Um, and, yeah, I have to be a little bit married to my job. But, yeah, it's just I'm happy that I do what I do now. Thank God. What is your ancestry, by the way? Random question. Um, Like English, Irish, Welsh, but we always say someone fucked a Spanish pirate along the way for the olive skin because there's like a part of um, England where we're from there where there's a lot of like Spanish people ended up there. 
Where's that? I don't know. I have no idea. I'm, I just know, I just know that. Um, I used to pretend I was Italian because I love Italian culture and I gesticulate so much that you would think I'm Italian, but no. And like all the family meals, like coming together. Yes. Yeah. We, we are very, like I have friends who are like Greek or Italian who are like, you guys are a very ethnic white family. Like they're like, you guys are ethnic. Like in terms of even my mum, my mum is kind of like, if you think of the stereotypes of like a, like a wog mum, she can sometimes be like that in terms of how, um, yeah, just like we're, we're big and direct and kind of opinionated and yes, food. I don't know. I, I, I agree. I agree with that um, observation. Not a derogatory term in Australia. I feel like. What? wog yeah I feel oh like sorry not yes a bad sorry. word in other places but yes sorry <laughs> we, I'm using that in a way of love and like it's no, no, an endearing it means, way yeah. I think it means something else in uh, other places so I'm just okay okay clarify for the listeners <laughs> um okay cool so what okay wait last question when you say you felt like you weren't enough, like everyone was like, you're too mm. much. And you're like, I'm, I'm not, not. enough. Is that yeah. you, what you wanted to be more you? Or you were like resisting what they were saying? Like, what did you mean by that? Yes. So I think that I sometimes was overcompensating with my bigness, even though my bigness is authentic, right? What it is now is authentic. It's not, I'm, it's not overcooked. It's me. But at the time, I think I overcompensated because I thought that to feel more, I had to be more and do more, whereas it was actually the opposite. It wasn't about adding more on. It was about like peeling stuff back. And I think I don't – definitely what's happened in me feeling myself is that I feel more me, but I didn't realise at the time that I didn't feel me. Like I think I might have even said this to you when we were chatting when we were away, you know, I like the way I used to kind of even communicate with people was quite guarded. It's like, I just wasn't fully in my body yet. And so even though I was like definitely warm and talkative, I was, I was in my head. I was thinking about how I was coming across always. Right. And I, yeah. So I think I said to you that I feel like I used to need to have like four or five drinks to talk to like a guy or whatever, how I just talk to them now at 8am in the morning if I bumped into them on a train. Like I think it, it was an inhibition. There was something, how do I explain it? I think, yeah, there was definitely just something I at the time didn't realise that I wasn't probably that happy or that there was a lack of authenticity because I didn't know what that was. And I think like even, you know, being with, yeah, like in my relationship, that was really healing for me because I feel like, you know, Vanessa, the therapist, she was, I always say Vanessa, the therapist, cause I have a best friend called Vanessa. I'm always like Vanessa, the friend, Vanessa, the therapist. But she was like, she was like, you're really cute when you like peel back your layers. She's like, but it's so hard to peel back the layers, but it was deceiving Delia because I come across like I don't have, like I can come across like I don't have layers cause I can be a real open book about lots of stuff. And even now this happens like, um, yeah, one of my best friends, Lil, she always finds it funny. She's like, everyone thinks that they're getting like the full version of you. But she's like, they're not. Because like the real, the realest version of me is like the peeled back, like cutesy little vulnerable me, which now I know how to, I can bring that. I can weave that in and out as I need to, right? Of course, there are situations where you don't want that. Like sometimes you need your armor on at work or in a social situation, but generally, I now know how to make that part of me. I don't have to hide it away. I don't have to protect it because I'm not fucking scared of the world or what people think. Whereas I used to have to hide that away. So there were layers. It was like these shells, like all over my body. It's like peeling it all back. So now I choose when I show that part and when I don't, but it, I'm not scared of it. Yet. Like I, it's there, it's this, it, it's everything. Right. Um, yeah. Amazing. Oh my God. I just realized we haven't even talked about body image stuff. Yes. So you, so 
where, as you referenced us being away. So at the wedding, we were both bridesmaids. Like you, that was like game changing. What you said to me, like I will not forget that because I was feeling very Which bit? like, oh my god, the neutrality thing. So the bit where it was like we were outside, out it was so windy, our hair was like going everywhere, and I was like, yeah. oh my god, I feel so like I just wasn't feel I don't know it was like obviously everyone looks amazing and I was like do I look good like I was very fixated on mm. like do I look good enough and like I'm seeing all these people that I haven't seen for years and yes how like I'm so anxious about needing to look like amazing mm. and you were like it is the least interesting thing about you, how you look like there are so many other things that I don't know. Like it was yes, it was yes. Just so like, okay, oh my God. no, like, I know that, that like, shattered stuff for me because I think even with this podcast, it's taken me so long to go to video because I'm like, oh my god, I'm like, you <laughs> have to look at my face for like two hours, and it's like I'm not pretty enough or whatever. Which is like, yes, no one gives a fuck. <laughs> First yes, of all, they need yes. to like listen to you talk and not. Anyway. Yes. So I think, yeah, a quick spiel on that. Number one, um, things I, I won't like properly reference where I get stuff from, but I can send you like some books for the show notes because I think I am a white, like thin, objectively attractive woman. Therefore, a lot of the learning that I've done about this has come from people who um, their like interface with intersectionality and their experience of walking through the world or moving through the world is more challenging than mine from like that body and appearance perspective. And therefore, yes, I feel like I owe that explanation to them. Do you have a question before I spiel? I was just going to say, you. The, it's, I don't know. It's more like, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, it's like this whole conversation. I think it no, does matter who you are. You accepting yourself, like for yeah. any human, we want any mm. human to go through the journey that you have been on, on like not feeling comfortable in yourself to yes. feeling comfortable. And it's like, but like, I will say, I agree. Humans. We it applies to all humans, but I, this is where I think privilege comes into it. And there's a great Mari Beecham quote again. I can share it with you for the show notes. But we want everyone to go through that. But I am an educated like what do we call most, I don't know, like upper middle class purse, like white, thin, objectively attractive person. Like, yes, we want everyone to go through that. But it, it, and just because you have all those things, it doesn't mean you will like yourself or just because you don't have those things. It doesn't mean that you won't like yourself, but you have to acknowledge that you can't, we don't go through that journey in a vacuum. You go through that journey in this fucked up and beautiful world of ours. And so therefore I think those that the privilege and intersectionality stuff is relevant, but yes, on our conversation. So, um, more than a body, I think is the book that I'm getting this from, but it's about like your body being an instrument, not an ornament. Like what does our body do? What does it allow us to feel like for me, a beautiful thing? There are two beautiful things I think about. One is pleasure, like sex. It's like, how can you hate this body? They can do such a beautiful thing and experience like so much pleasure and like even like bring babies into the world, whether or not that does or you do or don't want that to happen. But it's like if you actually cut the shit out, which is really hard because there's so much shit all day every day telling us that we need to like look smaller, cuter, whatever. Yeah, so it's like thinking about what the body does and what it has the potential to feel. And another thing is, okay, when a baby is born, Sorry, I need a burp again. Cut that out or keep it. I don't really care. Um, so when a baby is born, it is so pure and cute. You like kiss its feet. You love it. You're like, oh my God, this is the most like divine thing I've ever seen in my life. What changes? Like when do you, when is it then acceptable to start hating yourself? Like, do you get to an age? Like, okay. Cause you know, think about what you say to yourself, right? It's like, would you say that to your best friend? Probably not. But let's, it, let's even take it a step further. It's like, at what point does it become appropriate to start saying that? Like when you're four years old, is that when we're allowed to start hating on ourselves? When we're eight, when we're 12, like when is it? So that's just an interesting thing that if you actually attack the logic of what you're doing, you're like, oh God, this is so illogical. 
Um, and also just on this, I want to just spit a few things that I usually say to people about body image, but my belief is if you can't get your body image in check from like podcasts, bit of self-work books and stuff, I'm like a bit of investment in some therapy if you can, or like something, some resource. I don't know why we accept having shit body image as the norm. Like that's just to me completely fucked up, but it is the norm, but it is not okay that people have bad body image because it keeps us out of our full power. That's another thing. I'm like, this is a feminist issue because if we, if we are, if we are consumed feeling shit with how we look, that is energy and effort that is detracted from other things that we could be doing. And I don't just mean like thriving at work or something. I mean like having fun as well. I'm like, either way, it keeps us playing small because it, it is a, I think I'm not saying men all have perfect body image. I'm just like talk more about women. And I do think it affects women more because we have higher beauty standards. Um, but I'm like, I, yeah, I hate that. I hate that it like keeps us playing small, but yes, in terms of like some comments. So number one, how you look is the like least interesting thing about you. I love getting dressed up. Like even right now, I love that my hair was boy waved yesterday. I mean, I also love when my hair slicked back. I love wearing big earrings. I love how I look, right? As in like putting together how I look. So when I say how you look is the least interesting thing about you, I don't mean therefore fucking put a potato sack on and that's that. And you're not allowed to wear makeup. Oh my God. I love wearing makeup. I love doing all those things, but it is the least interesting thing about you. And it's an expression of self more than anything. Whereas I think often people are so caught up like, Oh, I don't like my arm. I don't like my this. So then they don't wear a dress that actually would be a perfect dress for them to wear. Um, another thing I say to people, look at the whole cake, not the raw uncooked ingredients. I don't want to eat a raw egg and a big um, mouthful of flour and a big mouthful of sugar. I don't want to eat that, but I want to eat the cake. So we like do this weird thing where we pick apart our body instead of like zooming out and looking at it at this beautiful divine thing as a whole. Another thing that I think is powerful is neutrality, being neutral. Like the more neutral we are, oh my God, it's just life changing because I used to like, if I thought I looked good, I'd be like, oh my God, I look so good. Love this for me. Or like, I remember, and this is like trigger warning, disordered thoughts. Like I remember being like loving that I had a really flat stomach. Like when I was in year 12, I vividly remember being like in a shower, like getting changed and being like, oh, my stomach's so flat. Um, and, and, and at that time, then if you're so happy that your stomach's flat, what does that mean? That means when your stomach's not flat, you're not happy. So now... I find that the more neutral I am about when I feel like I look good, it's also the more neutral I am about when I feel like I don't look as good, right? So it's all like it just oh, it all just kind of like falls away. Um, so there's that. What else do I say that's about body image? I mean, I've had to do a lot of work on this and I believe this is controversial, but I believe unless you unlearn fat phobia, you cannot like, and, and you're aware of diet culture. I don't think you can accept your, um, your body, even if you're a person who's in a thin body, because I think the systems, right. So I am not going to do justice to this, but there's, um, and books that I'll put in the show notes. That's where I like learnt this stuff from. Um, but there's a book called the body is not an apology. And the author's name has escaped me. And I was like, mind blown when I read that book, because it's like, you, you, yeah, you understand that. I think where people are getting it wrong is they go, Oh, I'm just going to try and love my body. But I'm like, no, no, no. But if you don't work on unlearning the bullshit that we have been learned, we have been taught about all bodies, then you will still be judging your own body through that lens. And I, when I, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about like saying people who are in like straight size bodies, right? That they go, oh, I'm working on my own body. It's like, no, 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 you have to actually do like the whole system, which I understand is hard, which is why people don't do it. But then you live your life fucking picking apart your body. So, yeah, I think for me that's the best investment I've ever made in myself is like fully breaking up with diet culture and unlearning fat phobia. Amazing. It's so funny because it's so different as well, depending where you are in the world, the different cultural messages. 
you'll get. Or yes. even I was thinking that I, one of my best friends like shamed me in that moment. You're saying in year 12 of having a flat stomach, like I was shamed for like having abs. And now I've always been like, oh my God, it's so like being muscly. Oh my God, I feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'm like mm. being... You know, it's like, mm. but then it's so weird because then like another shamed part of you me, like, shamed you for having muscles, shamed you for having being like a muscly woman, or shamed you for being like, oh, why aren't you eating? You've got abs. No, like I always eat so much. Yeah, food no, no, but always yeah, 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 like tr- just like lots of like I rode and like what, like mm. I guess I don't know. But then it's mm. so weird that it's just to point out how counterintuitive it is because some people might be like. I really want, and now like there's a part of me that is like, oh, like I wish my body was like that. But then there's this Mm. other part that's like, no, then you'll be rejected. Like it's Mm. horrible. It's unappealing to have muscles on your stomach and whatever. So it's so, Mm. you know, and then you go play like in the, when, (laughs) sorry, right. But when I lived in the US, it's very like, you know, having like, a big bum is like yes. well, now I feel like that's catching up, but you know in Australia it wasn't really that wasn't really a thing. And then it was no, like, it's like oh, that surf so girl good. was like the I, body ideal in Australia. I would say that like tan toned, like not too muscly, like yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's so subjective and like, um, but yeah, it's a lot to be like, oh wow, I just heard that message for so long. Yes, and then, yeah, I think, and then then you're just shaming yourself and like losing, yeah, totally losing perspective. I think that cake yes. analogy is amazing because you're just like I love the cake, yeah. And I think as well, like you know, I don't even think when I say I don't think about how I look. Of course, I do. Right? It's not about not having the thoughts because we have been conditioned for years and years, and we will be conditioned every single day. It's about noticing the thought and not doing anything with it. Like if you catch yourself in the reflection and you go, oh, I don't think I look good. Oh, fuck. Well, now I want to go for a run or like whatever, some intrusive like disordered shit. It's like you might notice yourself in the mirror and you choose in that moment to go, okay, you neutralize it. It's like I did this thing and it was so hard for me but and I'm so far beyond this but this is how I had to start when I was trying to learn to love myself is I'm really, I'm a grateful person. I would always write things I was grateful for. But then I started a thing where I had to write three things I was grateful for to myself every day. And one of them had to be physical. Now, to me now, I wouldn't even do that. To me now, I'm like, well, that's unhealthy as well. But at the time it was like, I was trying to be like, you are not gross. Like, and I would sit there and I would write the thing and then I would have like a caveat, but blah, blah, blah. I would like rebut myself. Anyway, I think, yeah, for me, I, it's also hard instead of going, don't focus on your appearance and framing it in a negative. That's like scarcity vibes. Don't do this. La la la. I try and bring abundance to it. I don't think about how I look. I think about how do I want to eat? How do I want to move? I am obsessed with food and I love, I'm lucky that I'm educated and have access to beautiful food and produce. La 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 la. So I'm like, okay, the body that I have is the body, which is wakes up every day whereby I'm living a life where I eat, I f- like I fuel my body and my taste buds how they want to be fueled. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's like intuitive eating, right? Everyone's like, oh, but then you would eat a cheeseburger every day. It's like, well, number one, if you did, fine. Number two, no, you wouldn't because when you tune back into your body's cues, your body tells you what you need. Anyway, so number one, yeah, it's it's eating what you want to eat and moving how you want to move. That's the body you have. Like, I'm sorry, it just is. And obviously, you know, when we say health, I mean, health is such a loaded word, but I mean like, you know, the various markers of health. Um, But yeah, I'm like, I move how I want to move. I move for my brain more than my body. Like I really broke up with exercise during lockdown because I broke up with all food rules, which I think they do when people have eating disorders. I never had an eating disorder, but I definitely had quite disordered thoughts. Um, But yeah, because I broke up with it all. Then when I came back to it, I came back with like such a healthier relationship like I started moving again because of my PMDD like my moods and the doctor was like regular exercise like genuinely helps that um and so for me there's no part of me that goes I'm going for a run to punish myself or because of my I need to look a certain way and we know the data tells us that if we use appearance as a motivator for exercise it does not have 
with long-term benefits for sticking with it, which is I just love to tell people that because they're like, oh, who cares if I want to use my appearance? I'm like, well, you should care if you want to exercise long-term for your body. Anyway, so I look at when I go out for a run or go and do anything, it's like it's me time. It's my brain. It's like everything is so much. The cake analogy kind of works my whole thing with body body image because nothing is zoomed in. Everything is zoomed out and it's all holistic. It's like how do I feel? What feels good? What tastes good? And I think, yeah, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that I am in that spot but it took a lot of work and reading and learning and I'm learning okay last three questions unless you want to add anything else no that's good I think tell them to listen to maybe some of my other the like intro podcasts as well I feel like that's interesting if they like the vibe wait you tell people now oh, Where do they okay you? <laughs> okay oh so if you want to be on board for the chaos I have an Instagram called conceiving it all, but life's busy. So I'm really not posting much, but I do, I do still post beautiful food. And whenever I apologize for not posting like the diet culture stuff anymore, everyone's like, no, you have changed my relationship with food and in particular butter. And I'm like, great. If I'm changing people's relationship with butter, great. And I have a podcast. There's probably like five or six or seven episodes. I stopped doing them, but they are still useful in terms of learning more about this body image, diet culture, intuitive eating, fat phobia. They're still, yeah, a good little series to go and listen to. Which is also called Conceiving It All. Conceiving It All. Yep. I before E except after C when you're spelling conceiving. Great. Okay. What? Forgotten the questions. How do you stay grounded? Running. Um, Talking to my, my family and my friends are very real. We are all very direct and real they keep me grounded. My bosses, my bosses have the perfect balance of like building me up and empowering me, but keeping my feet on the ground. So it's literally, it's salt water, being outside, running, walking, and the, the real, the realness, the authenticity of the people around me that keeps me grounded that that, like everyone keeps my feet well on the ground. Is there a book that's had a big impact on you? Yes. There are, so many that I find that question actually really hard to answer. Um, I do think the one I can't actually uh, picture the title of it, but the one I was talking about, about the body stuff, I'm going to send you the books because I think off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to tell you the, all of them because I'm overwhelmed, but I'll send you the ones that I think are amazing. Okay. But mainly stuff around body image. Yes, although two books that are more um, just helping me help me be more in my heart space um, were Dear Sugar by, you know, the woman who wrote Wild. What's her name? Dear Sugar is like a collection of, it was like a agony art column and then they printed, oh, my God, there are the balloons on the screen again. <laughs> um, it was like an agony art column and they printed all the answers and, honestly, that book is like, harrowing but beautiful and like you know I've made like significant life decisions based on things that I read in that book that made me realize things and I was like oh my god like I broke up with my ex because I read one of the answers in that book and I was like oh my god I can't be with him around like doubts because I I, like loved him so much but I just had doubts and I think I'd been suppressing them and then also on that vein a little life is another book that's just like so harrowing um but beautiful and what three words describe the best version of Georgie? Ooh, um, energized, um, uplifting, and something about like presence. Maybe just present or presence. Yeah, love that. Great, Amazing. thanks. Thanks. Much. That was fun. Well, 